Now, new research says one of the more insidious features of the new coronavirus behind COVID-19 is its ability to settle into unsuspecting hosts who never show signs of being sick, but are able to spread the virus to others. In a study published on the 3rd of June in the Annals of uh, Internal Medicine, researchers at the Scripps Research Trans National Institute reviewed data from 16 different groups of COVID-19 patients from around the world to get a better idea of how many cases of coronavirus can likely be traced to people who spread the virus without ever knowing they were infected. Their conclusion, at minimum 30% and more likely 40% to 45%. One of the more challenging aspects of the coronavirus pandemic has been the prevalence of asymptomatic cases or people who are infected with the virus and can spread it to others but do not feel sick. Uh, to uh, talk a little bit more about this issue of asymptomatic spread of COVID-19, Gigi Granville, an immunologist and senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health joins us now via Skype. A very good evening to you and thank you so much for speaking to us, Professor. Let me first start by saying, are you concerned as many countries ease their lockdowns and pretty much open for business now? Yes, it's, I mean, it, it, there, there are lots of concerns um, for the reason you mentioned, because it's very hard to keep track of, uh, of how infections are spreading when so many of them are asymptomatic, and yet so many people are have um, have very serious uh, courses of disease, um, the most vulnerable, of course, being the older group of the population. Do we know what the extent of asymptomatic spread is worldwide and how we can effectively identify those cases? Yeah, so it looks like the people who are asymptomatic have the same virus load as, so they have the same amount of virus as uh, people who have symptoms. Um, that makes them um, probably just as transmissible to others. Um, you mentioned the 30 to 45 percent. Um, the U.S. CDC is going by 35 percent at this time, but this is probably going to change as we know more. Perhaps there are some symptoms that some of those asymptomatic people have that they just didn't tie to the disease. So mm -hmm. with, with hope, you know, maybe we can find some more things to get that number down a bit and so people can isolate themselves earlier. So it's very interesting you talk about uh, asymptomatic people having symptoms. What would those likely be or what have they been found to be? So there are a few reports of some unusual symptoms, maybe loss of um, the loss of smell and taste is one of the ones that has been coming up. Um, uh, COVID toes is another one where people have strange blisters on their toes. So maybe they weren't, uh, maybe some of these people who are classified as asymptomatic have a few symptoms that didn't really slow them down. Um, they still went into work, et cetera, but, um, but maybe, or they did their normal routine and certainly didn't isolate themselves mm. and uh, mm. hopefully will identify more. But it's looking pretty um, unfortunate for this virus that there's so much asymptomatic transmission. Do current testing methods detect asymptomatic cases? So the, the testing methods um, would catch them if you test them. So uh, so you would, if you're looking for virus material, um, you will find it in an asymptomatic person. If they are able to transmit disease, they would have the virus. So you would be able to test them. But that requires you to test not just asymptomatic uh, people, but asymptomatic people as well. Mm. And is there a greater vulnerability of community spread as a result of people being asymptomatic and spreading it? Absolutely, absolutely. Because if people don't know they're sick, then they don't know to close themselves off to people that we know are vulnerable, like the geriatric population. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, it's it's really and it's a, as you said, an insidious feature of this virus. Is there a country at this point that has shown high levels or high numbers of people uh, who have um, displayed? asymptomatic uh, symptoms or who have spread the virus asymptomatically uh, and as a consequence their numbers have jumped up exponentially well so i mean you will find asymptomatic people the more testing you do so the countries that have done the best job in testing will will be able to see those um those cases and those jumps 
Um, unfortunately, that's not the case across the board. Um, so, so a lot of places are mostly focusing on the worst, um, the most severe cases, the people who are hospitalized, missing um, in the counts, people who are, are symptomatic but not as severely affected, and, uh, and asymptomatic people altogether. Mm. I, I mean, as a globe, we have been following these various models, obviously uh, applying it to your own country. But what is the relationship between testing and situational awareness, for instance, of the outbreak in terms of public health officials? How do they connect? So testing is very important for situational awareness because um, prevalence in general, even in the most hard hit areas, is quite low. Um, you know, mostly under 20 percent. Most people are vulnerable at this time. So, um, so it's important to have that that constant testing to be able to see if a community is suddenly going to um, start seeing a lot of cases, and especially if there are places where you would expect there to be more transmission to be able to focus uh, testing on those places so that you can quickly isolate. Mm. That's uh, certainly the case when it comes to nursing homes and, and places where you are going to have uh, or where you're going to have a lot of contact inside with poor air circulation. So some countries would def uh, depend a lot on uh, community health workers. What are the non-pharmaceutical interventions that they can apply if they're not re relying on government intervention, for instance? Well, for the the, the non-pharmaceutical -pharm interventions that have been, um, that, we, that we can only do what we can do, and that is to use masks or face shields or both. Um, to be as physically distant as possible. Um, six feet is a guide, but, um, but as, as much as possible. And to um, be as outside as possible, you know, with as much air circulation as possible. So, and frequent hand washing. So these are all um, things that we can do. Um, maybe eye protection, wearing, wearing glasses or goggles. These are all things that, um, depending on the work environment, is uh, can be can can limit transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just quickly <laughs> throw in this question, Gigi, and I know I'm throwing you a curveball, but I am interested. I think it's a, been a subject of conversation. These protests that we've seen, especially in America. Is there right. any danger of the numbers spiking up because you have so many people out there, even though they are uh, wearing masks? Right. I mean, yes, when you have people together, you have that, that risk. Um, outside is always better than inside, and mask wearing is better than no masks. And, um, and a lot of the populations who have been in this country, um, there have been much higher percentages in, uh, in black communities. So, uh, um, so there's a lot more um, people who are already have had the disease. But nonetheless, yes, it is a concern, um, but these are all public health risks. You know, racism mm. is also a public health risk. So we need to, people need to balance these things and, and, uh, and stand up for their own rights. And that's an apt note to end it on. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Judy Granville, immunologist and associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of uh, Public Health. She says racism is also public health. That's something that we'll be uh, talking about in just a few moments, the impacts internationally and, of course, uh, the genesis of all of this. What can you and I do to end this uh, systemic racism all across the world?